And welcome to Leadership Redefined. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Dr. Charlie Russo here. And of course, Dr. Bernardo and Dr. Nunziato. Welcome, guys. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Um, so we'll, we'll start out a little bit, uh, 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 Dr. Russo, Charlie, uh, if you could give us a, if we, we talked offline for a good amount of time and we were lucky enough to hear some of your background. If you could, if you could sort of share for our viewers uh, your background, uh, some of your experience and your pretty illustrious career from what I can tell here. Um, and then we'll get into some of your thoughts on leadership. And and uh, in particular, I'm interested in, in uh, the, the breadth of your experience and where you've been and what you've done all over the world, really. But uh, why don't you do a quick intro? And we'll get into some, some questions around that. Sure, Al, thanks. And thank you guys for having me, Al and Richard and Anthony or Anthony, as we we're kidding before. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't wear my, my faith on my sleeve, but I'm a practicing Roman Catholic. And I mentioned that because I was in the seminary for four and a half years after college. And I learned the value of, of trying to broadly be Christian and treat other people as you yourself want to be treated. I grew up in a blue collar family. Neither one of my parents graduated high school. My father was a New York City parkie, a manual laborer for New York City. But I was exceptionally quiet as a child. I went to, always wanted to be a priest went to college, still wanted to be a priest at St. John's University, entered the seminary in the hope of getting a PhD in theology and becoming a faculty member back at St. John's. And when I entered, that was something that looked like it could happen. But a combination of, of changing uh, missions within the community, they were interested more in some other things that I just frankly didn't want to do. So I went to a diocesan seminary in my native Brooklyn, decided I didn't want to be a parish priest. And it all kind of began from there. I, I like to think I've led a charmed life. I like to say God takes care of it, it's a little children. I'm a worker. And I think another thing that's important with working is always be open to, to meeting new people and getting to do new things. I taught social studies before and after law school. And while I did my doctorate, I taught part-time at the university. I also taught English comp at Nassau Community College for a couple of years, part-time. And as I look back on my career, which I hope is far from over, even after 30 years as a faculty member full time at three different universities, I realize how fortunate I've been to work within the, the, the world of ideas. When I was in my 20s, even into my early 30s, I always thought I'd want to get a PhD in theology. I went to law school, didn't want to practice, came out of law school, decided I wanted to go back into education. And frankly, I tripped over this area called school or education law. I taught at Fordham for three years where I was the school law guy, went to Kentucky in 1992. And since 1992, with one or two exceptions, once or twice online, all I've taught are school law courses. I've been very fortunate, as I'm sure you know, in departments about leadership, law is one of the areas where somebody can, in fact, does get a, a special line in addition, here at Dayton, I finally, a number of years ago, was, was granted a joint appointment. So I'm half time in the School of Law and I'm half time in the School of Education. And as I say, all I do are teach about school courses on school law. I, I learned a long time ago from a number of people the value of networking and being active and, and never saying no. And I've had opportunities that a, that a million years I never would have expected to have had. I've gotten to travel and I, and I do my best to bring other people in and give other people opportunities. I don't like to talk about leadership, so to speak. I prefer do, doing leadership by example. I've, give, I've given many, many people opportunities to write with me or for me in different projects of mine and try to lead by example. When I work with these folks, I, I'm not terribly anal. I don't think if you saw my office, it's am messy. Um, I'm not quite Oscar Madison, but I'm not Felix Unger either. <laughs> Use that old analogy. But when my name goes on something in print, if it makes me satisfied, everybody else is going to be satisfied. And I try to help other people get that. When I was a kid, and then I'll stop after this point. When I was about 20, I met a man, some of you may know from St. John's, his name was David Evans. David was a patristic scholar. I worked in the university library for four years at night. So I got to know a lot of faculty members. And David 
David Beecher Evans, at Beecher as in Harriet Beecher Stowe, was probably the greatest influence in my life. He taught me what it was like to want to become an academic. He taught me the value of hard work, writing, editing, thinking about what you say and teaching. And the lessons I learned from David, I try to pass on to others. One last item. David used a metaphor that I use usually at the beginning of every semester. He called it the wedge theory. As I think you guys have similar backgrounds to my own, growing up in Brooklyn, my idea of wildlife was a squirrel or a pigeon. I don't do camping. I don't do sleeping in the woods. <laughs> you know, if God wanted people going out and sleeping in the woods, hotels would not have been invented, is my perspective. So I've never camped, but David used this metaphor that if you go camping and you want to build a fire, you take a log, you take a piece of a branch, big piece, and you take something called a wedge, it looks like a doorstop. And you balance it on that log and you crack down on it to break it open. And then you do that again a couple of times to make firewood. Well, his metaphor was let my class, let the material I teach be the wedge to open up your mind. And I tell my students, I don't want you thinking like me. I want you to think with me. Properly understood, tastes great, less filling. I did a, a debate two weeks ago uh, through Brigham Young University with a dear friend. And we're about 179 degrees apart. But so what? I like the Yankees, you like the Mets. It doesn't have to be personal. We could disagree and not be disagreeable. Right. And one of the things that I fear in academia is that we become so polarized and I try to break down those walls by giving people opportunities. I don't care who you voted for, what team you like, what beer you drink. We're in this together. Let's try to make schools operate better. I tell my classes in education that when you come to school, my class, when you go back to school tomorrow, I want you to have information that'll help you run your school better tomorrow. This is not how many angels dance on the head of a pin. It's applied knowledge. And in the same way, kids in the law school, what kind of advice are you going to give your clients? But the law schools are kind of different breed. Wonderful kids, wonderful young men and women. But they're not educators, and so they have to think about it a bit differently. But let me stop and see if you want to follow up with your questions. I don't want to just talk at you for the whole time. Hey, Charlie, I couldn't even imagine to tap into the depth and breadth of your knowledge about leadership and, and, and education and higher ed. But you know, you, you, you raised a couple of good points about, about some of the, the contentiousness that, that has started to develop, not only in our society, but obviously in higher ed. But you know, I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts about the whole concept of, a, of, of the knowledge base of educational leadership and, and the educational leadership department in the School of Education. Um, there's another contentiousness that I find, and that's the one between the practitioner and the researcher. And I'm just curious, you know, as to your thoughts and, and, and some of your, your experiences uh, about that, that, that situation. Sure. Well, thanks, Andy. Um, two things come to mind when you were talking a little bit when, when, uh, when Al was mentioning it before. A thought that is in the back of my mind, I guess I don't always have it right out here up front, but I think it kind of exemplifies some of the things I try to do is this whole notion that was big, I think, in that leadership circles about 20 years ago, maybe still there a bit, but frankly, I don't write, I don't speak, I don't think, frankly, very much about anything if it doesn't have law on it, as it relates to school leadership. Mm -hmm. But that concept, before I get to the practitioner, uh, academician distinction, is servant leadership. We have to lead by example, whatever we do. Um, I tell my students, and I did, I just did two presentations as part of a team from the University of Dayton. One was to Columbia, South America. The other one was to Argentina, through some of our programs. And when I talked about, I try to explain to them, and again, it's a little bit different in overseas. I know you guys have traveled, but I've been real fortunate to speak in a lot of different places. The night before we got locked down a year ago, last February, my wife and I were scheduled to travel to Brazil where I was gonna give a talk on sexual harassment on Tuesday, Monday night at nine o'clock, the university said no more, for, no more international travel. I would have had 4 million miles this year on Delta. Wow. I'm still a little bit under 3.9. 
But as I said before, they don't invite me for my good looks. So I think servant leadership exemplifies what I try to do. Don't talk about doing it. Do it and bring other people in. Um, Anthony, you raised one of the, I guess it used to be called the $64,000 question. We might be old enough to remember that. Now they call it, I think, the millionaire question, although I've never seen any of those, any of those game shows. And, you know, I, I think of the, the, as it's called the scholar practitioner, and, and bear with me for a minute, I hate the word scholar. To me, scholar is a value word. I would never call myself a scholar. If somebody says I'm a scholar, I thank you for the compliment. I'm an academic. I teach at a university. I do some writing and do things like that. But in line with something I said before about law and education and educational leadership, and we're all in this together, being so intertwined, we're an applied discipline. I like sitting around with my friends at the Educational Law Association meetings and arguing about Breyer's perspective as opposed to Thomas or Alito as opposed to uh, Sotomayor. And that's great stuff for a bunch of academics and a bunch of lawyers. But I don't cover that too, too much in my school of ed class, except on an occasional riff, because they need to know practical material. How are you going to make your school run better tomorrow? And in the law school, I talk about that a little bit more because that's a way of opening up their minds to thinking about how this applies to practice. But back to the heart of your question, I think, um, the, the academic practitioner thing, that's an unfortunate divide. You know, I, I like to think of the yin and the yang, we're two sides of the same whole. We need both. And one of the, one of the things that concerns me as, as I look at educational leadership as an academic discipline is that we have people coming into the field in their early 30s as academics with no school experience. Mm -hmm. I will readily tell you, and I will readily admit, I was not an administrator. I did my internship at St. Mary's Boys High School and in my last year, I got to do some low level administrative duties. That being said, as I, as I tried to plan out my career and I've had a great deal of good fortune that it fell into place, I was not looking to be a mainstream ed leadership person. I, I taught 11 different preps at Fordham in three years. I now teach school law, higher ed law, special ed law, sports and the law, religion and law. And I only teach the latter two only occasionally. Mm -hmm. I teach school law four times a year at my university. I also teach it at Fordham in the summers and I taught at other places. So that's who brung me. You might be familiar with law school, Foundation Press. This is my textbook. I just keep it out because I use it when I teach. Yep, I know um, it is. Yep. I know the book, yes. It's, you know, it's what I live for, but back to, the, to your, your real good question, Anthony. We need people who've been there, done that. Nobody wants to go to school and hear war stories every day. But when I teach, when I try to teach, I think I could speak with a little more authenticity by saying, look, when I was a teacher, this is what happened. When I was doing a, a suspension, you know, meeting with a father, here's what happened. Mm -hmm. it's not just reading it from a book now on the law school side I don't have that practice experience I didn't want to be a practicing lawyer but I've got the law degree which gives me the competence to get in there and talk about it and I know some people at the law school get a little frustrated with me and that's their problem I grew up in Brooklyn I don't take that stuff <laughs> plus I still play ice hockey so I don't mind pushing and shoving um, but I like to say that I have the law degree I didn't practice because I'm a teacher first and I have a JD second. I need to be a good teacher. I've, I've published a fair amount, my ego mm -hmm. aside. But you know what? It's all meaningless if I can't get up and explain to people in a classroom what it means. Exactly. Yeah. Just this morning, I got an email from one of my former students asking me some issues about practice. And I, I, I answer those with a certain amount of pride that they respect me enough three, four years down the line to still come back and ask my advice on questions. To me, that shows that I've made the connection between the theory and the practice. The theory is wonderful. Practice is wonderful, but you need to have the two together. They have to be mixed in such a way that you can't distinguish. 
Exactly. Between the two, and as I look at the the uh, the, the uh, field, I see more and more people coming in who are only, in theory, academicians, scholars, as they call themselves, but they don't know how how to make the trains run on time. You know, I learned my first couple of years at Fordham, we had a guy who had been superintendent of District 12 up in the Bronx, Ted Weisenthal, the youngest sergeant in the United States military in World War II for a while. He finished first in his class in basic, first in his class in advanced school. He was a tail gunner. He didn't talk about leadership. He did leadership. I learned a great deal of working with guys like that who've been there, done that. And so I, I recognize, and I hope I'm answering your question. No, actually, we need both. Well. It's essential. Yeah, you, you've articulated it perfectly, Charlie, and and uh, and I, I appreciate your thoughts. I mean, it's something that I, obviously, because I'm a practitioner, um, the only one in my department, um, and uh, you know, it's 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 a, a finding my way, you know, and, and and I think you you absolutely hit on the head. We need both. We need both the researchers and we need both the practitioners because you're absolutely right. Educational leadership is an applied knowledge. Mm -hmm. So well, well, well said, Charlie, well said. Thank you. So, so yeah, I, I would love to know too, and Rich, if you have a question, chime mm -hmm. in as well. Uh, Charlie, you shared with us that you've been, uh, uh, what, a million miles or 4 million miles, I think. You, Almost you, 4 million miles. 4 million miles, that, that's, that's, um, that's pretty impressive, but... Uh, to go with those miles, you've been to a number of different places, right? Um, all over the world. And I'm wondering if, if there are, because not a lot of people have that kind of experience. And it seems like you are very intertwined with like understanding. We talk about culture and dispositions a lot with Leadership Redefined. And it seems like you're really intertwined with uh, all of these different universities, all of these different organizations. Are there commonalities for uh, departments that run well because of the leadership involved or departments that run poorly because of the leadership involved? Are there things that you see that are like, hey, they got it right because of X, Y, Z? And I know that could probably be another hour long conversation, but I would love to just hear your thoughts on the synergy of what you experience as it relates to leadership and the success overall. That, that, that's a good question. Thanks for that, Alan. And, and thanks, Anthony, and as well. And then Richard, Richard, the questions, the real good ones. Um, I'm a sports fan. And, and I mention that because I still play ice hockey and I keep my statistics. I played 23 games and I think I, I just figured it out this morning. Let me get a piece of paper here. <laughs> I played in uh, 18, I played in 23 games and I've got six goals and one, two, three, four, five. And 13 assists. I've got almost as many points per game as I played. I keep statistics just to keep myself amused. <laughs> I think I've spoken in 31 different countries on all six continents. And raising the question about what what make what runs better, I think the better run schools are the the better run departments, pardon me, or schools for that matter, meaning college or university schools are the ones that have the balance that Anthony and I, that Anthony introduced to the question about practitioners and, um, and academics. I was a visiting professor for two months, about, I think it was, um, in Brisbane, Australia. My first extended stay overseas. And I was invited because I'd met some people at, at conferences I attend and they also, shared the concern about balancing the need for theory and practice. I go to Europe and I'm regularly involved. I've organized conferences, two major conferences that I organized. Uh, one was in Berlin, one was in Amsterdam. And as much as I enjoy going to the conferences in Europe and I have many, many friends all over Europe. I mean, I never imagined I'd be so, so fortunate to have this. Um, there's not a lot of recognition of the need to, to link theory and practice. It's mostly abstract instruction about the law, which is important, but doesn't inform educational leaders. On the other hand, I know I'm just trying to juxtapose, another conference I attend pretty regularly is up in Canada, 
the Canadian Association for the Practical Study of Law and Education. That's a mouthful, the Canadian School Law Group. But they've got practical right in their title, so they recognize the need. And in most of the programs that I know of, I've not been a visiting professor in Canada yet for some reason. I have to get somebody to invite me up and give a talk. Um, they recognize the need, the different people I know in different institutions, to tie, to link that theory and practice together. I've been to China a, a number of times, and I think they're trying to get, in, get involved in the same way. I think they're trying to recognize that they have to bring this down into the schools. It's a more centralized model than we're used to, so it's gonna take time. And Australia and New Zealand are, are pretty localized. They're not a big centralized government, so they recognize, as I started with Brisbane, um, that you gotta to tie together what goes on in schools from nine to five or nine to three or whatever to what goes on at the university. We're not two separate and distinct parallel tracks. Right. We're running down the same highway together. And yeah. I used to teach for the college in New Jersey in Mallorca, Spain, tough job. Somebody had to go to the Balearic Islands, Mallorca for two weeks in the summer. Really tough on the family. We all went. And at the beginning of a semester, you do your bona fides, you know, who you are. And I said I was a visitor, and it was, by the way, it was probably 75, 80% Americans teaching internationally and a collection of people from other nations, depending on the summer. And I'd get up and talk a little bit about who I am. And, and you know, your reputation carries over from one summer to the next. But I'd said I was a visiting professor in Brisbane. And at the break, this big hulking guy in my class who's Australian came up, grabbed my hand and said, I got to shake your hand, Yank. You're the first one who got it right. You said Brisbane, not Brisbane. <laughs> so I think part of that, though, when you talk about the cross-cultural, when I travel, I've got a, I always bring a phrase book. I've got a collection of God knows how many different little phrase books. I get, I'm almost fluent in Italian. I used to be fluent when I was in the seminary. But I don't want to be the ugly American. I at least try to say hello, how are you, thank you, and that sort of thing, to show that I recognize I don't expect you to accommodate me. The, the, the problem is with that, every time I try to speak the other language, they say, no, 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 speak English. We want to practice. <laughs> but to me, that's a form of leadership, trying to set an example for others to try to follow. And I've invited many friends and colleagues to accompany me on these trips if they want to. And, and some have taken me up on it. So, I hope that's responsive, but I, I think they're, they're aware of that and recognize the need to continue to make education and law my particular specialty, mm -hmm. um, practical, not entirely abstract. Yeah, and I love, I love how you're talking about the connections and relating and it speaks to empathy, understanding of being approachable, um, opening lines of communication as well. Rich, I, I, I'd love to, to talk to Charlie all day here, um, but we're, we're, we're coming up on wrapping up, Rich. Any closing thoughts or, or uh, final comments uh, around what we uh, just discussed with uh, Dr. Russo? Yeah, I'm gonna try to do the Eric Severoy, but it's gonna be impossible, uh, but I will give it a crack. And uh, Charlie, I've been un uncharacteristically quiet because I'm just trying to absorb. And uh, you and I know each other very slightly and I certainly have enjoyed uh, our, our relationship and appreciate and I'm grateful for our, re our relationship. And we'll have to meet and up at Disney one of these trips. That's, that, that's one of these years we're gonna make that, <laughs> pull that together. Maybe we'll write an article about that someplace along the way. But you know what it is, I, I, I'm putting you, I, the other two guys are gonna be gonna laugh when I use the word I'm going to use. There's about five buzzwords I use and here's one of them. Uh, uh, the sum as an S-U-M, of you in terms of just listening to how you responded to the few questions we're able to get into our 20 minutes together is it really not it's just i just can't do it i'm not able to distill it nor would it do you justice nor to our listeners to try to uh, uh, say this is what this man said put it in your pocket and make it part of your soul it would be impossible to do that but, nice uh, but but here's some things i did hear i heard humility a quiet humility. You weren't wearing all those, uh, all those degrees and all those six continents, and uh, books and articles and presentations that you weren't wearing them on your sleeve so that we would worship at your feet. None of that. What you were doing was, was just sharing with us how the sum of your experiences has transformed you into what you were able to do for other folks. 
And uh, I think all of us are really appreciative of that. I mean, I have other words here. You certainly have provoked and catalyzed. I, use, uh, I think you used the word, I'm not sure if it was you or Anthony, I think it was you, of servant leadership. And again, you weren't beating, the, beating us over the head with that, but you were certainly uh, uh, demonstrating that in the, in the deepest sense I can po possibly uh, express in the few more seconds I wanna talk here. And you helped me recognize how we can and sh should um, be committed to a, a synthesized purpose of helping other, empowering other folks to blend those kinds of experiences to make leadership work for kids in, organ, in school organizations rather than put them into, and this is a very trite word to use, but here it comes, uh, silos that we sometimes find ourselves in, especially in higher ed. So uh, I know I'm speaking for Alan for, and, and for Anthony, and I know that uh, those of us who, those people who have the good fortune of uh, listening to this podcast, watching this podcast, uh, will walk away with that. So I thank you on behalf of everybody. It's gratifying. It's, it's humbling. Now, something if I could just add before you get to Anthony, should have said before, one of the one of the things I try to live my live my life by believing is that I'm only as good as what I do tomorrow. You know, what I've done in the past is nice. I love it. You yeah. know, I, I, yeah, I've gotten a couple of awards. I don't put them on my walls. I don't even know where they are. I have an honorary PhD. I'm not even sure where it is. That's past. I got to do it tomorrow. The other thing, as you know, I've, I've met, alluded a few times, I play ice hockey. And every place I go, I'm Charlie Russo. I'm not doctor. I don't I introduce myself in class, Charlie. Um, my perspective is if I get up and I'm Dr. Russo, I can be Dr. Horses Rear End. Yeah. But if I call myself Charlie and they want to call me professor at the end of the term, I burn their respect. Right. You got to earn it. When I was in the seminar, I knew guys who would go out to the mall wearing their collar to be called father. You know, give me a break. Yeah. It's the person inside of it that matters, not the piece of clothing. Yeah. You know, so I, whatever I do, I got to do it again tomorrow. I, I tell people I used to be a type A personality. I'm not anymore. I'm an A plus. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, listen, Charlie, That's great. I can listen to you all day, Charlie. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Really. really appreciate it. I, I mean, I love so many of the things that you talked about. I love that you never say no to an opportunity um, in the door, so that's open. That's a lesson for folks in itself. Um, and uh, sort of living for tomorrow is awesome as well. You got somebody poking up behind you there, too. Is our, is our six, almost six year old granddaughter, Laurel? I want to come say hello, Laurel. Come say hello. Uh, hey! hey. So that, yeah. see, we got, oh, you should be very talkative. Well. That made, that, listen, Charlie, everything you said was great, but that made the show. You know that, right? Laura, I make our day, and it's just a rad day too. So thanks so much, Charlie. Really My appreciate pleasure. your time. Right? Yes. Oh. And take care, everyone.